Holy Cross. So before I um, dive into the word of the Lord this morning, I want to take all that responsibility you just put on me and put it on the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. (laughs) Woo! (laughs) Amen. Thank you. Can't preach under that stuff. (laughs) Oh, but I know it's the truth. But thank God that we have him to carry us along and to... Wonderful thing. So if you've um, been around here, you know that we're spending some time, I believe, at the leading of the Lord to talk about the person, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and um, to cultivate a relationship with him who he is God. And um, the effectiveness of that ministry will hinge on our relationship and the how functional, if we can say it that way, that relationship is. It is Mother's Day, so I've got to have one verse of Scripture that connects Mother's Day to my topic today. So here we go. Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. I know it's such a common passage, but let me just read it to you. Luke 1, beginning verse 30. And the angel said unto her, this is Mary, who's receiving her assignment as a mom. Not just any mom, the mom who's going to carry the Savior. And here it is. And the angel said unto her, do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. Let me pause right here. And I want to say to you mamas out there today. Do not be afraid. You have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive. Now moms, just be relaxed. For many of you, this is a spiritual word today. Perhaps some of you physical you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name jesus he will be great and he will be called the son of the most high and the lord god will give to him the throne of his father david and he will reign over the house of jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end and mary said to the angel how will this be since i am a virgin and the angel answered her Here we go. The Holy Spirit, come on, will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Goes on to talk about Elizabeth who, in her old age, who was barren, also conceived. And the angel says to Mary, verse 37, nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary, here's a good mama's response, said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. I just want to speak a quick blessing over you moms here today. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, though this account was a few thousand years ago, that same calling to bring forth the Savior through prayer, through character, through raising up a new generation, just like Mary did, though she had the actual son in her womb. Lord, I thank you that here in this place, these moms in this place, Lord, what a gift they are to us all. I thank you for the grace that's upon them to fulfill the purpose you've given to them, the unique purpose that they carry as mothers. God, I just speak your blessing today. Whatever they are have in their heart, Lord, that they would see the travail of their souls, their prayers, all that they carry in them. And they would be satisfied. And you would be glorified. I just speak now. Great favor upon them, for with you all things are possible. Lord, if there's any of them here today that are weary, have grown tired. I pray for a refreshing and a reviving over their lives today. Lift them up by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. All right, so we've been using as our kind of launching pad text, John's Gospel. If you've been here over the last few weeks, um, 
you'll know these verses. I'm not going to spend any real time with them. I just want to read them to get us into today's flow. Jesus is speaking, John 16 and 12. He says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. We spent some time talking about the calling of God's people as priest to bear certain things, and yet we're needing some help. We're not in shape yet. We're not capable of fulfilling our destiny, practically speaking. And here's the remedy for that. Jesus, I want to say some things, but you can't bear them yet. You're not in a place yet of of where you need to be. Here's how I'm going to fix that, though. Verse 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. You could say, after reading this verse, Well, I thought it said there, Pastor, that the Spirit will never speak about himself. So why are you talking about him today? That can't be the Holy Spirit in you today. Speaking about the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit doesn't speak about the Holy Spirit. I agree. The Holy Spirit doesn't speak about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit only speaks what Jesus tells him to speak. So Jesus told him to speak about himself. Are you with me today? Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit that Jesus has told us very plainly who's going to be the one guiding us and leading us. And if we don't get that, and if we can't be led by him, then that relationship is not going to be effective and we're not going to have the benefits of it. So to me, it's so important for us to not You know, you can tell, come on, ultimately at the end of the day, if it in fact is the Holy Spirit that's speaking, it'll always ultimately bring us back to the person of Jesus Christ. It's never going to get off to the point where it's all about the Spirit, the Spirit, and never focus or ultimately shine on the person of Christ. That's His pleasure. It's what He loves to do. It's what He's doing right now. He wants to do it more. That's the text we started with. Jesus is speaking. He says, I want to talk to you about some stuff. But you can't hear it. You can't bear it. You're not in a place yet. So i got to work on some stuff inside of you so that, Jesus speaking now, my conversation with you can happen and you'll understand it and use it for my glory. I want to open your ears. I'm going to have to use some means and ways to get there, which the Spirit of God will be that for you. So, John 20, verse 21 and verse 22. We're going to just kind of lay a few scriptures out here this morning as we get into this relationship piece with the Holy Spirit. Again, Jesus is speaking. This is after His resurrection. He's appearing to His disciples, which He did on multiple occasions. And here we go. It says, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now check this out. This is, I'm convinced, the first moment when somebody got born again. Biblically speaking, this is it right here. You know, you can't be born again. You couldn't be, I should say, born again until Jesus had died and then rose, raised, was raised from the dead and went back to the Father. Until that happened, no one could be born again. Okay? Right now, Jesus has risen in this particular text. He's standing in front of his disciples. They're seeing the resurrected Christ, which is one of the qualifiers for salvation. If you confess the Lord Jesus with your heart, your mouth rather, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, right? You got to know he's raised from the dead to even be born again. Well, that's what's happening. Here's the raised Jesus, resurrected Jesus, standing in front of his disciples. And he says, just like my father sent me, I'm sending you. And then he says, here it is, but you can't get, you can't do this on, I can't send you out without some goods here. Receive the Holy Spirit. And in this moment, The Spirit of God 
came inside. Up to this point, the Spirit had been with them, but Jesus said the day is coming when he'll be not just with you, he'll be in you. And here it is, the Spirit comes inside. Now this is an important passage of Scripture because many people in Christendom have the belief that says this, once you receive Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, the Holy Spirit moves inside of you and you become the temple of the Holy Spirit. That is absolutely true. It's absolutely sound doctrine. But where they many land with that is that that's all you'll ever need of the Holy Spirit and there is no second experience. What we would call the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And they say, you know, no, you got it all when you got saved because Jesus moved in. But think about the context of this verse of Scripture. Come on, be good students here today. This is the same group of people. Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit. And they receive it. They get born again. Spirit moves inside of them. But it's the same group he says to, don't go out trying to do everything yet, but tarry in Jerusalem until you get filled from on high. On the day of Pentecost, they're all, it's the same group. They're all waiting. He says, wait for the promise of the Father. So though the Spirit was inside, they had not experienced this second experience or the empowering of the Spirit for being a witness to the world. It's a totally separate experience. And I tell you, some people have just got off the elevator too soon. They just pushed the wrong button. They thought somebody said you were going to the third floor. No, you're supposed to go on to the seventh floor. Everybody knows it's on the seventh floor here. Come on, perfection. Perfection's going to happen not only when we have the first experience, Passover, three major feasts in Israel, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. Three major feasts given to Israel as pictures of the progress of every born-again believer. Passover is where you get born again because the lamb was slain at Passover. Jesus was the lamb slain on the cross. That's where you get saved, born again. Second major feast, Pentecost. That's where the Spirit of God, Acts chapter 2, you can read it, was poured out and the church was empowered with the goods to be witnesses. Second feast, second experience. Third major feast in Israel is yet to be fulfilled Spiritually speaking, those other two were already fulfilled on the actual days of the feast. Jesus died on Passover. On the day of Pentecost, I'm talking about the actual calendar day in the Jewish calendar. The Holy Spirit was poured out, Acts chapter 2. There's a third feast coming called the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the final in gathering of all that God had from the beginning and the greatest celebration the earth has ever seen. It is where God finishes his work. In people listen we've been saved we're being saved and we will be saved I've been saved in my spirit my soul my mind my that's the mind will intellect is currently under construction can you say amen right and one day we're gonna get glorified bodies spirit soul and body Passover Pentecost tabernacles it's going to be one finished product. We're, that's where we are. We're in route toward perfection, completion. Aren't you happy that our current condition isn't the end of it all? Come on, somebody say amen. If this is all there is, I'm not so happy. But there's more. There's something coming, and we're in route, and we need to understand. That's why Paul says, I'm pressing for the mark for the prize. I'm not just going to settle in in some pew somewhere. I want everything God has for me, and I'm going after him. I'm going to finish, right? He that endures to the end, and so on. So here, it's an interesting scripture. He says, just like God sent me, the Father sent me. This is Jesus speaking. Even so, I am sending you. And then he says this strong word to them. Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to focus just a little bit on this idea of the mandate for us to receive. The Holy Spirit in the Greek, not that I'm a Greek scholar, but here we go. This word is not a passive word. You know, we think of receiving like I'm just here. Somebody else is doing the action 
and I'm on the receiving end. We think of it in a passive sense, but actually in the Greek language, this word to receive is not passive, but active. It means to take, lay hold of it, to accept. I like this, be amazed. To receive means be amazed. So when Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit, it's not this passive, okay. It's like, let me have that. I want him. I'm after him. I'm going to lay hold. There's an active role we play in receiving. Be amazed. To, uh, this is an interesting, these are just kind of from Strong's Concordance, but just check them out. One of the ideas under this word, to receive, meant it has this connotation to it. Receive when I call. In essence, what it says to me is this. It's like, if I come knocking, will you answer? We're talking about cultivating a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And let me just say this practically speaking. The Holy Spirit is often coming to us and knocking. If we're going to be those who receive him in his fullness, we've got to be those who are willing to answer when he calls. Open the door when he knocks. Stop what we're doing. It amazes me how easily we get interrupted and distracted. I have to confess, you know, my smartphone is my friend and it's my enemy. There is a function on my smartphone that says do not disturb. And just if I'm going to be real candid to you, I go into times of prayer and there's sometimes when I don't click it over to do not disturb. And the reason is because there's a lot of important things going on. And you never know if that person I've been trying to get for the last three days might try to call and, you know, and it amazes me and it shouldn't, but it amazes me how available I am to people. How unavailable I am at times to the Holy Spirit. I don't want to miss a call. I don't want to miss a text. I don't want to miss a WhatsApp. If you don't know what that is, it's okay. All these ways in which people communicate with one another. How much access can the holy spirit interrupt now there's an interesting function uh didn't plan to be here but here we are anyways interesting function on the phone you know uh, you can put it on do not disturb and the only calls that will let in are those that are in your favorite list so you know you got a little list of favorites right favorites these are people the family members maybe people that you're constantly in there they're, they're kind of have a higher priority or whatever, and it only lets them in there is the holy spirit on your i mean number one are you putting the do not disturb on number two is the holy spirit on your favorite list filters <laughs> you know you can't be present for everybody all the time and i, I i'm just saying where does the holy spirit fall in our relationships now i'm talking to me not to you you just happen to be here listening i don't know about you but i i don't want to miss his call i want to be able to be interrupted receive him when i call this word to receive means to catch to obtain. So just a little insight to how the Lord has led me over the years and how I get ready for what I'm doing right now. I pray. I spend time praying. I pray in English and I pray in an unknown tongue, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit, which helps me get past the limits of my natural thinking. That is what the gift of tongues is about. It's an acknowledgement that my natural mind, though it is a gift in itself from the Lord, is very limited in what it can grasp. And God didn't want us to be limited, so he gave us this gift of tongues with 
accompanied with the baptism in the Holy Spirit that allows us, our spirit, to pray according to Paul. So what I do in preparation for ministry is I pray. I pray with my understanding, but I pray in tongues. And I just kind of get my heart ready. I also prepare notes. I have notes here I'm working off of today. And my hope is that these notes were actually given to me by the Spirit <laughs> while I was praying. And I, so I put it all out. I've got it here. And it's in front of me. But my, my posture, once I've prayed and I've prepared my notes, is God, I've, I've got them and I, I'm thankful for the notes. But I'm trusting and I'm believing for and I'm looking for the real-time flow of the Holy Spirit. So if at any moment you want to say something through me that I didn't prepare to say or that I wasn't even thinking about saying, may I be available. See, to receiving the Holy Spirit, we might think, well, that's just... In, no, I'm talking about in every given moment of life, am I open to His steering me in the direction he wants me to go. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21 says this. The Apostle Peter says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Here's a good question. Can you be moved? Or are you dug in and playing it safe? Can you be moved by the Holy Ghost? You see, the scripture that we read, the Bibles we hold today, were manifested into the earth. That word is an eternal word that preexisted, and yet somehow the miracle of the scripture coming to us occurred when men, you know, holy men, we think of, we're going to get here in just a second, what holy is all about, really. But holy men, these weren't like great guys who had it all together. These were broken guys who had learned in their brokenness to be dependent on God. That's what we're talking about when we say holy guys. We're talking about broken guys, guys that had done their own thing long enough and realized that every time they were left in charge, they'd screw it up. And finally, they got to a place of surrendering and trusting and leaning on someone else. The person of Jesus Christ manifested through the Holy Spirit. These men spake as they were moved. So let me just talk about practical stuff. I'm hoping to get it real practical. Can God, the Holy Spirit, move you? I mean, if you're standing one place and the Spirit of God comes, I mean, what do you think that really looked like the day they were receiving these thoughts? They were doing one thing, going one way, had their own agenda, the best they could it wasn't like they were doing something evil necessarily they were just doing what they thought they were supposed to be doing and suddenly the spirit of god came upon them and began to take them somewhere they had not planned here's the question for all of us can god do that with you and with me can he actually move you well the way you know that is when it actually happens he shows up. I would say that there is a bit of a contest that often goes on when you have settled on where you're going and what you're going to do. And suddenly the Lord shows up and says, I want to move you in a different direction. I want to move you somewhere out. Can you be moved? So part of my um, life's target, if you will, I'm talking right now just kind of about ministry in this setting, is... I'm always trying to stay available to the Holy Spirit. I've missed it, God only knows how many times. Missed it a lot more than I've hit it, I'm sure. But nonetheless, I stand up having prayed, having written down notes, and just saying, God, if you want to move in some way I'm not ready to, or hadn't thought about, I'm here. <laughs> okay? That's my posture. I think it's a good posture. I think God uses it for me. He's helped me and whatever. And here's a thing that maybe you're not aware of, that after I'm done preaching, okay, after I'm done preaching, I will take notes on what I said. Or what not I said, but what I felt the Holy Spirit say. After I'm done. Things happen in meetings I had no intention of saying. And they just came out. Boom. And I, inside, you don't, you don't see me do this necessarily, but I think, 
that was pretty good. <laughs> sure wasn't from me. That was the Holy Ghost. I didn't plan to tell that story. I didn't plan to, to use that illustration. Those words weren't in my notes. They just came. Why? My hope is and my prayer is and that, that in the moment, because I've prayed and I've kind of positioned myself and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to live my life in such a way that receives the Holy Spirit. Movable in real time by the Holy Spirit. So after the fact, I think, you know, if that in fact was the Holy Ghost who showed up in that moment, unexpected to me, later on in the day, after it's all settled down, I get out my little tablet and I enter notes on top of my other notes. Those notes tend to be way better than my notes. <laughs> they just do. They're just way better than my notes. Now, when you say, well, why do you do that, Pastor? Well, it's kind of an interesting dynamic. You know, I'm getting ready to travel overseas again at the end of this month, as is Dr. Wins. We'll both be in Africa, different places. And uh, I just kind of noticed a pattern every time I've been privileged to go out you know, months and months of standing before you, praying, seeking God, writing down, you know, sermons and whatever, and ministering those things. Many times, it's not uncommon, though I prepare and I still study and I figure, hear, you know, what the Lord wants to say to these people I'm going to. But many times, I'm preaching stuff to them that I kind of dug out here in front of you. So actually, you have a ministry among the nations. You have forced me to hear from God. Not only for you, but for them. And many times, it's just the way it works. Now, God does real spontaneous stuff out there, and he shapes things all kinds of unique ways. It's not just like a cookie-cut thing. But here's my point, is that the very notes that I've added to my notes, are you with me? The notes that I heard came out in real time, flowing in the moment with the Spirit of God. Those notes, when I preach them somewhere else, they are still alive because they're from him. And there's actually an increase given as a result. So there's, hear this now, God wants to give us more. The question is, are we allowing him to give us more? And will we be good stewards of more? What are we doing with the more we're asking for? You know, it's the story of the guy who built a house and he borrowed the money to build the house through a bank and the bank gave him a draw schedule and the draw schedule said okay I'm going to give you X amount of money for the foundation and when you're done with the foundation we're going to send one of our bank reps out to see that you did with the money what we said you said and we said that we were going to do and they come out and if you did what they you had agreed to then they give you the next sum of money to now do the framing and the roof or whatever it is however the draw schedule is set up and I've said this before but here it is again just because it's coming to me right now <laughs> hallelujah the simple truth is this we come sometimes to God and we say God give me more and God's answer back is what did you do with the last batch I gave you I just want another draw from heaven amen God wants to, but God has set up an accountability structure for the church, and nobody wants to talk about it. We just want more, more, more. I have many things to say to you, but you're not able to handle it yet. So i got to work on your ability to handle it so that I can give you the more. Oh, I'm talking better than you're saying amen. It's a fact. We've got whole strands of Christianity that say it's all by the grace of God and there's nothing for you to do. And I say, I don't see it in the scripture. I think God's, God is a good steward of his own resources. And he's releasing what can be trusted. That means there's got to be character development and a willingness to let God grow us up. You know, here's the good news. He wants to give us the kingdom. <laughs> he wants to bless us. But he doesn't want that blessing to cause our hearts to become so sideways that we'll forget God. That is what can happen without character development is we get the blessing and we use it to our own lust or our own carnal nature 
which is still in control. So God's working all these things at the same time for us. And he wants to know, are we going to be stewards of it? So we're talking about the Holy Spirit. We're talking about his ministry. He's constantly coming to us. Will we receive him as he comes, when he comes knocking? Are we available to go his way? Have we considered the fact that uh, his way is better than our way? You know, the verse, and if we could get it back up there, John 20, 21, where Jesus says, um, <clears throat> as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Isn't it interesting that Jesus was sent? We have been sent just as Jesus was sent. Jesus says, just like the Father sent me, I am now sending you. But notice this, the Holy Spirit was also sent. Now, hang with me because that's an important point. Let me just read to you this text here, John 16, 5 through 7. Jesus, again, is the one speaking. But now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, that's talking about the Holy Spirit, the helper, will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. So Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And by the way, I'm also sending the Holy Spirit to you. Now, this is why that matters, I think, to us. Why does it matter that the Holy Spirit has been sent? Because if you've been sent, which he has, the Holy Spirit's been sent, you understand what it feels like to be sent. You understand the cost of being sent. Wait a minute. Let me make sure you're with me. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, then he's talking to his disciples. That's you today. I'm sending you. Your destiny is sent. You're, you're sent. There's a purpose for your life. There's a path for your life. There's a, a plan for your life. Jesus says, I'm sending you. But you're going to need some help. <laughs> Receive the Holy Spirit, because to be sent, you're going to need some help. And by the way, the Holy Spirit knows how to help people who've been sent because he's been sent. We could say it this way. He's, you know, Jesus was able to identify with our human weaknesses. Why? Because he was a human being. He came on and took on flesh, and he could identify with our weaknesses. Well, the Holy Spirit also can identify with the issue of us not wanting to always go when we've been sent. I'm talking about being able to be moved by the Holy Spirit from my path to his path or the plan of God for my life. He has a compassion and a skill to identify with us because he's been sent and so have we. And this spirit we're talking about, the Holy Spirit can help us with our attitudes. You see, for the Holy Spirit to be sent was a pleasure, not a duty. Say that one more time. The Holy Spirit, when he was sent, it was his pleasure. Actually, when Jesus was sent, it was his pleasure. Jesus said, I delight in the volume of the book it's written of me to do your will. I delight to do your will, O oh God. When God the Father said, Son, I'm sending you to the earth, the Son didn't go, Really, God? Really? Have you seen the squalor down there? <laughs> you know, no, no, no. Jesus said, Father, I delight to do your will. The Holy Spirit is, was not upset when Jesus said, when, when Jesus came back up into heaven and went, tag, you're it. Tag, you're it. I've done my part, now it's yours. Boom, tag, you're it. And the Holy Spirit comes down to the earth, not bemoaning his new ministry here on the earth. He didn't come bemoaning it. He came ready to, to light a bunch of people up. A bunch of weak, floundering, timid people hiding out in a room because of persecution. The Holy Spirit says, oh man, wait, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to get so inside of them that these few people are going to turn the world upside down. You see, the Spirit of God was excited about being sent. He knows 
how to change our attitude. When you hear the word God has sent you, you're thinking, does that mean I have to give up my motorcycle? Does that mean I have to, does that mean, you know? I mean, sometimes when I think of going to Africa, and I have to just tell you, Africa to me has, has uh, over the years has been challenging at times for me. For some reason, I find stuff there. And sometimes when, when, I, when I go, I, there's two parts that happen inside of me. One says, Africa. And one says, Africa. One's me, the flesh, and one's the Holy Ghost. You know? Sent. Sent. With a zeal and a passion and a love. That's something the Spirit of God is wanting to bring us to a place where we see that His plan for our lives is way better, more fulfilling, way better than the plans we scratch out for ourselves. He can help us because He's been sent and so have we and He's going to teach us how to be sent joyfully into this harvest. John 14 <clears throat> talking about cultivating this relationship, not running from the one who's been sent to help us, but actually rejoicing at his presence and rejoicing as he moves among us. John 14, beginning in verse 15, Jesus is speaking. If you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the father and he will give you another helper. Uh, King James says comforter to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Notice these terms. These are important terms. If we're talking about having a relationship, the world can't receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. You see, seeing him and knowing him are important ideas when it comes to relationship. Here's a question for us. Do we see him and do we know him? He's talking specifically here, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. How can you see something that is spiritual? You know, isn't that just kind of like this mist that comes around or something? How do you see? I don't ha have necessarily the, the time here today, but... I'm going to give you the quick flash just for those of you that might not know it. You have two sets of eyes if you're born again. You've got natural eyes and you've got spiritual eyes, right? Scripture says, while we look not at the things which are unseen, but at the things which are seen. For the things which are unseen are temporal, but the things, I'm sorry, the things that are seen are temporal. The things that are unseen are eternal and they're of God. If you're born again, you actually have two sets of eyes. You have natural eyes that you see natural things with but you also have spiritual eyes. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, except you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. He's talking about spiritual eyes. The problem is we spend so much time trusting our natural senses that we have basically malnourished spiritual senses. We, we're not aware of them and we're, we often don't yield to them, but the point being, to know him, the Holy Spirit, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him is an indicator that God wants us to see him and to know him. You know him, Jesus says, for he dwells with you. And check this out. And he will be in you. So if today, this is prior to the cross and the resurrection. But today for us, if you're a, you're a believer, he's not just with you. He's in you. OK, now that speaks very plainly to intimacy seeing this word seeing means to perceive to discern him have you discerned the holy spirit in a meeting let's say you can be in a meeting and there's no real tangible sense of the presence of god you know i mean everything can be perfectly in order the preacher looks good preaching his heart out, you know, whatever, you know. Everything's right. The AC actually fits my temperature, my body temperature. You know, whatever it is, you can have all your little things checked off, but somewhere in your heart, where is he? You know, it reminds me of Mary and Joseph to go to Jerusalem, celebrate Passover, and they're 
on their way home, and they're two days away from the city, and finally they're a big caravan of people just jostling along, having a great feast, party, and whatever, and suddenly Mary starts asking questions like, has anybody seen Jesus? I mean, we're two days out of the city, man. And you're assuming because everybody's happy. We got whole churches that build around just being happy. Keep the festival going. The bigger question is, has anybody seen Jesus? Now listen, for Mary, here we are, Mother's Day. For Mary, little pat answers of oh yeah he's in the crowd don't cut it come on many times in churches you can get that little pat answer that that just says you know oh he's here because wherever two or three are gathered there he is we can quote all kinds of scriptures but you know what sometimes i'm not content with just the verse I want to see him. And when Mary started hunting around, you know, everybody was saying, oh, yeah, he's in the crowd. He's in among the people. Don't worry about it. Mary said, you know what? Something ain't right. Something's missing. Got to find him. God, where are you? She starts hunting around. Finally, she goes and gets Joseph. She grabs him by the ear. This is my translation. <laughs> she says, we're going. Where? Where? We're going back to where we left him. Back to where we saw him last. Sometimes we have to repent. I'm talking about the church now. Repent. Turn around. Repent. Why? Because without his presence, all this other stuff doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. To perceive. So we want to get to know him. You know, just like Jesus, who likes certain things and hates certain things. He actually hates. Jesus hates. I know that's a strong word, and we have a hard time attaching it to Jesus. But let me tell you, Jesus hates certain things. Doctrine of the Nicolaitans, Revelation chapter 2. He's talking to the church. He says, uh, you know, you, you, I have this, you know, with you that you hate the doctrine of the, the, the Nicolaitans, which thing I also hate. It's strong language. Did you know that the Holy Spirit also loves certain things and hates certain things? I know I've told this story a lot of times, but I'll never forget the time I married my wife prior to marrying her. She thought <coughs> she was going to impress me with um, making her famous Brazilian Pujim. Pujim, I didn't know what the word was either, so don't feel bad if you don't know. Pujim, it's like a Brazilian custard. And it has coconut in it. Well, two things about me she didn't know <laughs> is I don't like custard and I don't like coconut. <laughs> All right? But everybody she's ever served that to, ever, has always gone, oh my gosh, that stuff's to die for. It's like the best. So we're, we're getting to know each other. And, you know, she's wanting to put her best foot forward. So what does she do? She pulls out the Pujim recipe. And she serves Pujim to me one night. And uh, she brings it out, this crowning moment on the table, Pujim. And I look at it, seeing and discerning <laughs> coconut is present. And I said, oh, well, well what's that? And she says, proudly, it's Pujim. <laughs> really? <laughs> what is Pujim? <laughs> it's custard. And it's all I can do to keep from, like, you know, an extra coconut. Extra coconut. You know, extra coconut's important when you're really trying to win the guy over. <clears throat> See, the problem was she didn't know me yet. She didn't know me yet. And uh, so she said, you know, so she started to, to wedge out this huge piece, man. I'm like, you know, I'm kind of full. But I sure don't want to push her away. So for love's sake, 
I want you to know I ate and ingested a piece of poutine with coconut the whole time shuddering inside. <laughs> Eric Snow, buddy, we were together there in spirit, brother. I'm just telling you. Like literally just help me, Holy Spirit, to keep it in, you know. <laughs> Never had the nerve to tell. She goes, well, what'd you, you know, kind of like then you start fishing for compliments. Like, what'd you think? Oh. All right, this is, I probably have never, I've never confessed this. Father, forgive me for lying that day. <laughs> for love's sake. <coughs> it wasn't until after we got married, no joke, after we got married, that I broke the news. I figured fish in the cooler, <laughs> you know what I mean? We're hooked, we're, hey, we're hitched, you know what I mean? That's a fishing term. You've got to be with me. Okay. <laughs> Honey, I do not like custard and coconut. <laughs> <laughs> Initially, she was a bit heartbroken. But then when she realized that there were alternatives to coconut and custard, like chocolate. Like, I'm a chocolate guy. Feed me chocolate all day long. Dark chocolate. It's awesome. Love it. Our relationship went to a whole nother level. Once she realized my appetite, what I liked and what I didn't like. You see, to know the Holy Spirit, you see, many times we, we're trying to please God, but we don't know the things that He enjoys and the things He hates and and if we want to get to know him, we need to spend the time to develop the relationship and to have enough security. Listen, he's not going to leave you. Okay? This is one of the powerful things about the Holy Spirit is that he, um, though he's holy, he can deal with our stuff. He'll never leave you. That's what Jesus said. He'll be with you all the way to the end. He's committed. He wants a strong enough relationship to be able to speak to us the things He wants to be able to speak to us. I wonder at times if the Holy Spirit, you know, Jesus Himself said it, I have many things I want to say to you, but you can't hear them yet. Our relationship isn't strong enough to hear them, but the Spirit's going to come and help cultivate a relationship that will allow you to hear and allow you and I to interact with one another. So if you were to try to describe this person, the Holy Spirit, what is the one descriptive term that is most often used here to describe him? He's called a lot of things. He's the spirit of truth. He's the spirit of power. I mean, you can go on with a whole list of names given to the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 11, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, fear of the Lord, all these things. But to me, the one resounding most used idea around this person is holy. Right? Come on. He's the Holy Spirit. Well, when you think of the word holy, you often, I think of, often you think of holy, you think, okay, well, gosh, I'm not very holy at times, you know, but he's holy. So how am I going to have a relationship with Holy Spirit when I got all my issues? Somehow, it's like there's this disconnect that somehow can occur between us and the ministry of this one who's holy. But when I think of the word holy, it helps me to think of holiness in this way. It's someone who's unaffected by, untainted by, unpoisoned by sin. Therefore, what is holy has power over what is not holy. As opposed to what is holy being needing to stay away from what's not holy. You've got to hear me here today. Listen, Jesus, the holy Son of God. That's what the angel said to Mary. His name shall be, he shall be holy, right? Jesus is hanging out with and prostitutes and tax collectors. Now, well, how can holiness be around all that mess? You see, we have kind of a funny idea at times about what it means to have a relationship with this Holy Spirit. Like, you know, I got so many issues. Once I get them straightened out, then I can start talking to him more openly. He says, no, 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 no. I already know all your issues. And that's the reason Jesus sent me. 
I'm not trying to wait for you to get it together so you can have a relationship. I'm the answer to you getting it together. Are you hearing me today? We can't get it together on our own. That's why the Spirit has come. So he's not afraid of your stuff. Oh, come on, that's better news than you're, you're letting on. He's not afraid. He's not afraid of the fact that you've been struggling with pornography. He's not afraid of the fact that you've been having thoughts of taking your life. Or not afraid of the fact that you're, you've lived a life of self-hatred and you cut yourself. He's not afraid of the fact. He, he's not intimidated by any of it. He's God and He loves us and He's for us. And He's coming alongside us to help us. One little last portion of, to me today. We're just trying to unveil so that we'll feel available to receive Him as He is. Oh God, how we need you. Genesis chapter 1, it's the beginning story. It's the book of beginnings and it's the time that we get a great insight into God's nature and the Spirit's function. Genesis 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Notice that the Spirit of God is actually hovering over what many would call a desolate wasteland. There are those, and I subscribe to this idea, that there was actually a world before, a pre-Adamic world, a Luciferian age. You don't have to agree with me on it. It's just my take on it in the Scripture. That's where the dinosaurs existed and all that stuff. It predated the 6,000 years of creation that we call today when we calculate it out. To me, they existed before. That's just where I'm at, okay? Pre-Adamic world, Luciferian age, and God judged it, destroyed it, and when this text comes on the scene here, in the beginning, God recreated. It's the idea of the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void or a desolate wasteland. A place that had once been inhabited that was judged. Now that's my take. You don't have to agree, but I see this either way. This text is amazing because what the Spirit of God was brooding over was not a pretty place. Let me give you some of the original words here. It was without form. It's the Hebrew word tohu. 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 From an unused root meaning to lie waste, a desolation of surface. That is desert, figuratively, a worthless thing. Maybe you feel like this. In vain, confusion, an empty place. You feel empty? Without form. You feel like your, your life has no form. It has no purpose. Vanity. Wilderness. That's what the Spirit of God was hovering over. Without form. And then the word void. Check it out. It's the word, I'm going to say boohoo, because you, many of you are crying. I know, but boohoo makes a better preaching session. Boohoo. Boohoo. All right, it's boohoo if you want to be technical, but it's boohoo if you're living by the Spirit today. <laughs> Void. Look at this word. Look at what it means. To be empty. Undistinguishable ruin. Void. You know, many people... These, you know, we're talking about a natural planet, the condition of a planet. But let me tell you, these are the conditions of people's souls. Empty, without form, void, feeling like there's no purpose for their life. That's what's going on. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. Here's what it means, the dark. Figuratively, misery, destruction, death. Ignorance, 
sorrow, wickedness, darkness, obscurity. That's a t- I, listen, as a pastor, I've heard too many stories. These are the words people use. Misery, destruction, ignorance, sorrow, all these things. This is the condition. And guess what? The Spirit of God is hovering, moving. Here's what this word moving means. It's kind of neat too, I think. To brood over. Look at this one. By implication, to be relaxed. Did you know the Spirit of God isn't all wound up about your problems like you are? We're like, ah! and he's like, I got this. I got this. Chill out. To be relaxed. To flutter. To move. And the last one, to shake. Sometimes, this is the, I- this is the word to move. The Spirit of God was moving. Sometimes he's got to shake some things up. He's not intimidated by these things. Actually, I believe this today, that for many of us here in this building, I know it's true of me, I have felt it in an ever-increasing way of late. The Spirit of God has been hovering over my life. (laughs) Why? Because God the Father has made up His mind to do something with my life and with yours. He's determined He set out to do it. He sent his spirit who is now anticipating a creation out of nothingness, out of brokenness, out of despair and destruction and formless stuff, things that feel so empty. The spirit of God is hovering right now. Waiting for what? Waiting for the word. Let there be light. You know, one of the first things that you can discern when the Holy Spirit is present is the light comes on. Revelation. Understanding. Suddenly, places you've been in the dark, you have an illumination about something in your life. Someone some situation that God's wanting to heal you from, whatever it may be, most importantly, to see the person of Jesus Christ and to see His love and plan for you. The Spirit. So today, instead of having a closing prayer, I want to have an opening prayer. That doesn't mean I'm going into another sermon. I want to have an opening prayer for a new season of relationship with the Holy Spirit. I want to have an opening prayer that our hearts would be opened to receive Him as sent to us who have also been sent. One who's called to help us, who's not intimidated by our weaknesses, and our struggles who has the power to take broken desolate lives and create something beautiful let's stand up if you don't mind together this morning Father, I just want to say this morning how grateful I am that you have not left us as orphans and you've not left us to figure it all out on our own, but you have sent your Spirit to us, not only to be with us, but to be in us. I just want to say thank you today for your help. (laughs) 
Lord, if there's anybody here today that has never received your spirit by receiving you, here we are, Lord. You're searching this congregation today from the youngest to the oldest. Age isn't the issue. It's the heart that's the matter. And God, today, collectively, whether it's for the first time or just if it's a fresh cry from our heart today, we are here before you wanting to receive, to take hold of, not passively, but actively, to acknowledge our need for you and to receive your help. Why would we ever refuse such help? Holy Spirit, today, here we are. I'm asking even now, Lord, in this opening prayer that you would open our eyes to see. Open our hearts to know afresh. May your name, Holy Spirit, show up on our favorites list. May you have access at all times to us. May we never put you off. when you call, when you show up, when you come knocking, when you have something to say to us, Lord, I know the things you have to say are designed to make our lives better, not bitter. Holy Spirit, here we are. Show us Jesus. Thank you. Right now, in your own words, just before the Lord, I just want to take a moment. You know, I, I love praying collectively for us. I do. It, it feels like a, such a privilege for me to try to voice what I feel the hearts in this room are saying. I love that. I, I appreciate it. It's a beautiful thing for me personally, but I'm always aware of the fact that God so longs to hear each one of us in our own words. And don't be ashamed. Just You don't have to say it loud. It can just be there between you and the Lord. But in your own words, will you just open your, your mouth and allow Him to hear your petition, your request, your receiving in a few moments, you and I are going to be outside these doors going on with our stuff. And I tell you, I don't want to be out there missing the greatest gift we've ever received apart from our salvation, which is God's very Spirit. Oh, Lord. I personally, Lord, I'm just going to talk to Him and I ask you to do the same thing. God, I just want to say to you today, thank you. Thank you for keep your knocking on my heart, Lord. Thank you today. Thank you. This altar can be open if you want to come and just kneel before the Lord. You want to stand there, it's fine. Just listen, don't be in such a rush to get out of here yet. Let the Lord, let him touch you. Thank you, Father. Maybe today you just need to say you need to confess some things. God, I've been afraid. God, I don't know how you're going to fix this. God, I, I got a lot of questions, God. I don't know what to do with certain situations. But I receive you, Holy Spirit, today. I receive your hand. I receive your ministry in the dark, broken places of my life. I receive your power. I receive your grace.
Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place, fill the atmosphere. Your glory, Lord. Heart longs for to be overwhelmed with your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, we make room for you. We give you our heart, Jesus. I just heard a little thought in my in my heart, and I feel like it's perhaps a word for many of you here today. My story about Christy fixing the Pujim for me. Maybe when you go out of here, the next time you're quiet and you're just spending some time with the Lord, you could say, Holy Spirit, would you show me what you like? I want to give you something that you like. You'll be amazed at what he may say to you. I've had the Lord say to me, I like you. I have. I've had him say that to me. I like you. Have you ever, have you ever heard him say that? I love you. At a time when you're feeling really unlovable, he just says, I love you. Thank you, Father. Liberty right now. You know, it's a, it's a great feeling to know that I'm finished. It is. It's a great feeling to know that I've simply done what I felt like God asked me to do and that today, as we walk out of this place, you're walking out not in my hands, but in his God himself, it's wonderful, brooding over you with creative plans for your life. So, Father, in Jesus' name, today, I just want to speak your blessing over this congregation, those watching by the Internet. God, I thank you that it's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by your spirit. I want to thank you today. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.